Hello everybody, it's Logan here, and if you didn't know, Nintendo's popular Game & Watch handhelds turned 40 years old last week. And so to celebrate, I decided to talk about Nintendo's first home consoles instead. The Color TV Game Series. That's right, we're not talking about the Famicom today. While the NES is generally seen as Nintendo's first true home console, they actually got their start in the first generation of consoles, beginning with the Color TV Game 6, co-developed by Mitsubishi Electronics and publicly released on June 1st, 1977, predating the Famicom by 6 years and the Game & Watch by 3 years. Powered by an AC adapter, the console had two paddle dials on the top of the unit to control the games. Additionally, there was a much rarer white variant that acted as an alternative to the standard orangey-yellow one. The white variant ran on C batteries instead of the traditional AC adapter. So now, the question we've all been asking. What could you do on the Color TV Game 6? Well, not much. Yeah, the Color TV Game 6, as the number implies, had six games, which were all different variants of light tennis. And that's code for Pong! To be fair, it was the 70s, and Pong was the most prevalent game back then, but it's still kind of funny that Nintendo's first home console was basically a clone console and not all that unique. Another twist to irony is that these days, Nintendo fiercely guards their franchises and posts cease and desist orders to someone who even thinks about doing something with Mario. Yet in the 70s, they were doing the same thing with Atari's Pong. I do have to admire the amazing design that the console has though, it does look pretty nice. But yeah, the Color TV Game 6 started the Color TV game line of consoles that lasted between the 70s to 1980, and the next unit to continue the naming scheme came out a mere week after the TV Game 6 unit's debut. The Color TV Game 15 released on June 8th, 1977, and is basically a souped up version of the 6. This time it includes 15 games, which are all still variants of Pong, but some of the games are a bit more interesting than before such as a ping pong style game, and Penalty Shootout, where the object is to get the ball past a constantly moving object. The biggest improvement, however, is that they made traditionally wired controllers, so you don't have to be holding the console the whole time. This massively improves comfort while playing, and is a welcome addition. Like the TV Game 6, there are two variants of the unit, with one being a lighter shade of orange than the other. These lighter units are a bit rarer than the standard orange units. And for some reason, the 15 models are perhaps the most well-remembered unit in all of the Color TV game series, with the console even making it as an assist trophy in Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, as well as the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch. Next is the Color TV Game Racing 112, and would you believe it, it's actually not Pong! Releasing exactly a year after the Color TV Game 15, this console is pretty cool for the time for the fact that it is a racing game. It uses this bird's eye view, and your goal is to drive on a track while avoiding other cars. These units use a steering wheel and a gear shift to drive, but there are also two smaller controllers to play the game with a friend. Probably the most notable part about this console is that it was actually Sugeru Miyamoto's first ever project while working at Nintendo, further cementing its place in Nintendo's history. Continuing on, we have the Color TV game Blockbreaker, released on April 23rd, 1979. This unit features a conversion of Nintendo's arcade game of the same name. Essentially, this is just a breakout clone, with a dial to control the paddle and switches to change to slightly different versions of the same game. The outside shell of the unit was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, and I guess he did a good job, because this unit is always the one my brain shoots to when Color TV game series is on the mind. Overall, another good unit, just not too interesting to be honest. And that leads us with the final unit in this series, the Computer TV Game, released in 1980 on an uncertain date. It was arguably the most interesting of the series. This unit contains the original version of Nintendo's first arcade game, Computer Othello. And when I say the original version, I mean the original version, as they literally stuffed the original arcade board into a heavy shell. In fact, the power brick alone weighs more than 4 pounds. The authentic arcade experience came with a price, however, with the unit costing a whopping $448.89. To put this into perspective, the Famicom that debuted three years later was only priced at $180. Additionally, if someone wanted just standalone games, then the Game & Watch series already had them covered at only $20 per unit. Unfortunately, due to the nicheness and price of this product at the time, the unit didn't sell very well and is seen as a collector's piece today with the price far surpassing its original retail value. As for the game itself, it had two modes, Player 1 vs Player 2, or Player 1 vs the computer. Overall, it was a very faithful port, but for most consumers, it just wasn't worth the hefty price tag. 
And that is the Color TV game series. And while the games might not be so interesting today, they were extremely influential on Nintendo, helping it change from a toy business to a video game one. And of course these units were fun. Games are games, no matter how simple they are. And even in these units, you could see some small glimpses of the Nintendo charm that we know and love today. Just take a look at each of the shells and look at all the small details that they put into them. And heck, Nintendo even released the 15 unit a week after the 6 just to address one of the consumer's main problems. Overall, the Famicom is remembered to many as Nintendo's first home console, but the Color TV units will always be Nintendo's true start to me. And with that, thank you guys for watching, and I'm curious to know what you all think about these consoles, and whether or not they should be considered Nintendo's first true home consoles. Finally, I'm always open to suggestions for topics, so if you have any, just please leave them down below, and I'll see you all next week. Take care.